Welcome. We'll go ahead and get started as people continue to wander in from their snacks and visiting. Mindfulness. Our motivation for having a seminar series on mental health at church is Jesus' primary commandment to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Because heart, soul, and mind together are our mental health. Heart and soul refers to our emotions and feelings. And mind refers to our thinking, our nervous system, and our behavior. We've looked at mental health as a spectrum that we're all always moving along, from mental health to mental health illness and problems. So at the health end, we have, as defined by the Surgeon General of the United States, the successful performance of mental function resulting in productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, and the ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity, which equals a healthy heart, soul, and mind. At the other end, we have mental illness, dysregulation of our emotions and feelings, disordered thinking, and behavioral issues, which are all problems of our, um, all dysfunctions that are carried out by our brain resulting in that keep us from being able to love God in each other with our hearts, soul, and mind. We look specifically at heart and soul in our seminar, seminar on emotional literacy, defining emotions and feelings, um, their role in mental health, and um, how psychotherapy and psychiatry work to heal emotions that are dysregulated. Today, we're going to look specifically at mind the role that mind plays in mental health, how some of the mind's natural tendencies can interfere with our mental well-being, and why and how psychology and psychiatry have embraced mindfulness as a way of maintaining our mental health and of regaining it when it's been disrupted. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The patterns of this world, both negative and positive, are contained in our minds. And the negative patterns can contribute to mental health problems and illness, and also be caused by mental health problems and illness, such as depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. So what do I mean by a negative pattern? Well, a critical inner voice, or, an, or a feeling that we take to be as a fact. For example, I feel hopeless, so I start believing that I really am hopeless. Maybe black and white thinking. I take a view, an all or nothing view of life. I, I don't get the job I really want, so I believe that I'll never get a job that I really want. Or maybe, I, maybe we catastrophize. We wake up in the morning tired and think to ourselves, I'm, I'm going to have a terrible day at work, and I know I'll get fired. These are all just examples of negative patterns that we might 
hold in our mind. So our question for today is, how do we renew our minds so that we can stop conforming to these negative patterns that they hold? The psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret. The inner room is inside our mind, and closing the door is shutting out distractions. Somehow, we need to create an inner quiet in order to achieve the transforming of our minds. And this ability to be quiet, and quiet to be still, and quiet the busyness of our minds is what we call mindfulness. And nowhere have spirituality and science partnered so completely with the fields of psychology and psychiatry as with this concept of mindfulness. The purpose of psychology and psychiatry is to heal our minds and emotions and behavior when we become ill. And research on mindfulness um, has shown us that a way of being that is helpful for maintaining our mental health is also help that, and that is helpful for healing from mental health illness and problems is also helpful for maintaining our mental health and for preventing mental health problems. And that practice is mindfulness. Doesn't it make sense that Jesus would motivate us to a practice that is necessary in order for us to be able to fulfill his primary commandment? Today, we're going to define the concept of mindfulness, look at the research on mindfulness and how it applies to our mental health and the treatment of mental illness, and learn about ways to increase mindfulness from simple things you can do right now to practices that you can um, take on to improve your mindfulness, such as Christian contemplative prayer. In public discourse today, you'll hear mindfulness used a couple different ways. Sometimes it's used to talk about the concept of mindfulness, and other times it's used to refer to practices, mindfulness practices, such as meditation. When we talk about mindfulness today, we're going to talk about the concept of mindfulness. And we're going to use a therapeutic definition of mindfulness. By that, I mean a definition of mindfulness as it's used for improving and maintaining our mental health. So the definition we're going to use is awareness of present experience with acceptance. Sounds pretty simple, right? <laughs> How many people here have driven somewhere, arrived at your destination, and suddenly realize you don't remember how you got there? <laughs> um, sat down with a bag of chips or a pint of ice cream or whatever your favorite snack is, and after a little while looked down and saw that it was almost gone and didn't realize it? Spilled something or broke something because of carelessness, inattention, or just or thinking about something else? How about listening to someone and then realizing you didn't hear a thing that they said? These are all examples of mindlessness. Mindfulness, on the other hand, 
focuses our attention on what we're doing. Let's look at some um, examples of activities where people tend to be completely mindful. Athletes in the zone, musicians performing, an artist engaging in their craft, a student taking an exam. I remember my very first experience of mindfulness. I was a senior in high school and I was coaching synchronized swimming. I belonged to a synchronized swimming team, and the other young women at the high school were beginners in synchronized swimming, so I would teach them during the year. And one day I was working with a young woman who was, had challenges with physical coordination. So she's in the water, I'm by the side, down by the side of the pool, and I've got my hands on her. We, in synchronized swimming, we do figures, much like in figure skating. So I'm helping her, I'm helping her, we're working and working and working to get her to do this figure. And finally she gets it. And I'm elated, and I stand up, and I look at the clock, and I realize that 45 minutes have gone by. And in those 45 minutes, I hadn't thought of it anything else but just helping her with that figure. And that was my first experience in life of what it meant to be totally mindful, totally focused on something. So close your eyes if you're comfortable and take a minute to think about some experience or experiences you've had in your life where you've been completely and totally focused on what you were doing. So the second part of the definition is with acceptance. So we have awareness of present experience with acceptance. This means maintaining an attitude towards our experience of curiosity, openness, and being non-judgmental. So what does that look like? Who here has the experience of seeing something or hearing something and jumping to a conclusion only to later find out that you were totally wrong? It can be embarrassing. Who here has the experience of listening to someone with an opposite point of view and trying to get them to see your way of thinking or change their mind without first accepting that this is their experience and getting curious about why it is that they think the way that they do and why this is their experience. Who's had the experience of having something painful or upsetting happen? and pouring yourself immediately a glass of wine or a stiff drink, making a bowl of popcorn and binge watching a television series or throwing yourself into another activity, rather than just allowing yourself in that moment to feel totally disappointed, upset, frustrated, angry about what happened. Our automatic reactions tend so often to disbelief and judgment and denial. I can't believe they did that. How could they do that? It's not fair. I don't know why anybody else um, thinks that way. I, I wouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be feeling that way. However, it's that judgment and that disbelief and that 
denial, that lack of acceptance, that is what causes our suffering. Acceptance of what happened, what someone did, what someone said, how we feel, what we're thinking of our emotions, that's the first step out of suffering. No matter whether it's the suffering of a big loss or a small mistake. Acceptance isn't always easy, and sometimes we worry that acceptance is a kind of passivity. Perhaps we hear someone making a rude or inconsiderate remark, or worse. Or maybe we, we find out that somebody we care about is being physically abused. Acceptance per, um, is not condoning somebody else's bad behavior, nor does it mean we don't step in if someone's physical safety is at risk. Acceptance does mean that we remain curious about our own reactions and that we don't judge the other person for what's happening. So, mindfulness, awareness of present experience with acceptance. So in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to take out an object, anything you happen to have on you, a cell phone, um, a wallet, a pair of eyeglasses, and we're gonna look for just a minute at that object with fresh eyes. And while you're observing that object, I invite you to also be aware of what you're thinking at the same time that you're observing that object. For example, looking at my cell phone case here, I could say that it's really worn out. That's an observation, a description. My mind could also say, this is a mess. I should have replaced this a long time ago. What are other people going to think? That's a judgment. So find an object that you have on you to observe. And let's take one minute to observe the object and also observe your thoughts about the object. Did anyone notice any judgments? It's our judgments and lack of acceptance that is what causes us to suffer. Anger is just anger. Disappointment is just disappointment. Sadness is just sadness. It's the judgment that's causing us to suffer. And this is why psychology and psychiatry have embraced mindfulness as integral to good mental health. The purpose of psychotherapy in psychiatry is to decrease a person's mental suffering. However, as we learned in the seminar on emotional literacy, emotional pain is inevitable. It's an inevitable part of life. We're all going to experience that. What successful therapy does is change our relationship to our suffering. It helps us to be less disturbed by the events that cause us pain in our lives. And this is why um, medical and um, psychotherapy researchers have been drawn to mindfulness because mindfulness is a skill 
that helps us to be less reactive and more accepting to the events that happen in our lives. When we relate to all of our um, ex experience mindfully, then we'll suffer less. So let's talk about how spirituality and science have partnered with this concept of mindfulness for mental health. So spiritual um, and wisdom and uh, religious traditions have always, have always had, throughout the world, have had mindfulness meditation as um, have promoted mindfulness meditation for the purpose of increasing our mindfulness. Hinduism, Buddhism, yoga in India and China and Zen in Japan, Judaism, Sufism, Islam, Greek philosophers, and Christian monks and mystics have always embraced um, mental health, have always had my, um, meditative practices. They all have meditative practices. In the 1800s, Eastern thought began taking root in America through the writings of Henry David Thoreau and other transcendentalists. And as, we, as you know from earlier seminars, Psychotherapy began taking root in the United States after World War II. World War II also exposed Westerners to Asian religion and philosophy. And in the 60s and 70s, young people in the United States began to be drawn to Eastern philosophies for the reasons I mentioned earlier, the lessening of their suffering by learning to be present and accept their experience, uh, they learned that, their, that emotions would have less tyranny over them. So both, um, mindful, both um, psychotherapy and medical researchers at the time, in the 60s and 70s, noticed the effects on their own lives and they began to do research on mindfulness. And now we have a large body of research that, which has demonstrated the benefits of mindfulness for mental health for all of us. 7,327 is the number, at the time that I put this together, is the number of peer-reviewed um, research studies on mindfulness. What peer-reviewed means is that when scientists do research studies in any discipline, they send them off to journals where they are reviewed by other scientists to make sure that they're valid and accurate. There's quite many more research studies than this on mindfulness, but there's this many, 7,327 peer-reviewed research articles on mindfulness. And it's important to keep in mind that most of these studies have been done with people who had some sort, sort of me, uh, mindfulness meditation practice, usually at least four to eight weeks. This is to keep the research consistent. So what do those 7,327 research articles tell us? Well, from our discussion so far, you can hopefully see that mindfulness practice is the practice of controlling your attention. For example, focusing on a candle or the breath. And this improved ability to focus improves your ability to detach yourself from thoughts and emotions that may be um, bothering you. Why would this be important in mental health? Well, for just a minute, consider what you usually think about. Some of the time, we're focused on what's happening right now, but more often than not, we're thinking about what happened before already and what we're going to do. This, for, for example, 
people who are, who are depressed tend to be, often feel regret or guilt or sadness about the past. This is a piece of music that was published in 1896, and I found examples of this piece of music all over the web. It's called, If I Could Only Blot Out the Past. And people who are anxious are afraid of what's coming, the future. Jesus knew this. Here's what he said 2,000 years ago. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When we're unaware that we're ruminating on the past or, or worrying about the future, then we're stuck in a repeating movie, sort of like Bill Murray's character in Groundhog Day, stuck in the same day happening over and over. Mindfulness, however, can help us to step outside of our conditioning. And then we can, we see what we're thinking, and then we have a choice. Just like, if you recall, Bill Murray's character in Groundhog Day kept trying different things on each day. We have that option if we are aware that we are caught in a repeating pattern of our mind, or a negative pattern. Then we have choice about how to respond. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So our minds have a default tendency to think about the past or the future. This isn't just a bad habit we developed. This is the default of our mind. In fact, it even has a name. It's called the DMN, the default mode network. And there's research to demonstrate this. So in your packet, in the very last page of the handouts is a copy of this slide if you'd like to look at it more closely. And the way this research, this is research on people's happiness. And the way that the information was collected was people with iPhones had an opportunity to download an app. And I think this, they're still collecting data. This data represents about 50,000 people who um, sent in responses. So the, they downloaded an app and they would get texts throughout the day asking them what they're doing, how happy they are with what they're doing, and what they're thinking about, and whether it's positive or negative. So along the bottom of the slide here is a scale that goes from unhappy to happy. In the top half of this graph are activities that people are engaging in. And the size of the dot tells you how much time they spent on that activity. And down at the bottom is our, the time that people spent mind wandering, and whether the mind wandering was unpleasant, neutral, pleasant, or whether their minds weren't wandering at all. So as you can notice here, there's not a lot of variation in our happiness depending on what we're doing. But there's a lot of variation in our happiness depending on what we're thinking. So this is unpleasant mind wandering, this is not mind wandering. So we are actually, and this is pleasant mind wandering, so we're actually much happier when we're thinking happy thoughts and we are happiest when we are focused and mindful and our minds aren't wandering. And there is research demonstrating that mindfulness meditation decreases the activity in that default mode network that's always trying to get us to go back to the past and forward to the future. And do notice where prayer and meditation fall on this scale. It's the tiniest dot 
right here, praying, worshiping, and meditating, but it's in the top third of what makes us happiest. And we're going to talk about some forms of prayer and meditation today that will both increase our mindfulness and our happiness. And if happiness isn't enough of a reason to practice controlling our attention, maybe our efficiency is a good reason. Multitasking, that's the buzzword of our decade, right? We used to think it was so cool to do multiple activities at once. Well, research has debunked that one. Um, even brief mental blocks creating by task switching, going from task to task to task, can cause us, can cost us up to 40% of our productive time, depending on how complex the tasks are. And as we all know, the, a very hot topic of research these days is the brain. And mindfulness meditation has been shown to have a positive effect on the brain. For example, one structure of the brain, called the amygdala, is responsible for fear and, um, and anger and sadness. And this area of the brain has been shown to decrease with mindfulness meditation. And the hippocampus, among other functions, is involved in regulating our emotions, which is very helpful for our mental health. And that has been shown to increase with mindfulness meditation. And for people who are long-term meditators, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed on this one, they have more gray matter when they get older in their brains, which, is, which means their brains are better preserved. So we've been talking about the research on mindfulness and the ways that mindfulness supports good mental health. I'd like to touch on the ways that mindfulness is used in psychotherapy. So sometimes mindfulness meditation is taught to specific groups, like people who are suffering from depression or anxiety or addiction. Other times, um, it's a component of a type of treatment. So four types of treatment that are evidence-based, meaning they were developed based on the research and they've had research on this treatment demonstrating that it is effective and can help. One is called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And you may have heard of this. Um, there's lots of classes in mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's an eight-week program. It was developed by John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And what this teaches is it teaches body awareness and mindfulness meditation and yoga. And over the past 35 years, this has consistently been shown to reduce people's both um, medical, physical pain, and emotional pain. And over 24,000 people have completed the mindfulness-based stress reduction course. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And these are things you can, if you're go looking for treatment, these are things you can ask for. Mind, um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is based on mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's a combination of cognitive therapy um, and mindfulness skills, and it was designed especially for people with depression. Acceptance and commitment therapy focuses on helping people to be more present, more mindful in their life, and then by doing so, being able to make choices to either continue their behavior or change their behavior based on what best aligns with their values. But it begins by learning to be mindful of what they're doing. 
and DBT, or dialectical behavior therapy. This treatment was designed to help people specifically who were at high risk for self-harm or suicide um, or people with um, borderline personality disorder. It's also been shown to be effective for people with eating disorders, people with treatment re um, resistant depression, and is being used for bipolar disorder and other um, severe mental illnesses as well. And DBT is is a collection of skills that are taught around mindfulness. Mindfulness is the core skill around which emotion regulation, distress tolerance, and interpersonal relationships are built. So now we're going to talk about some specific skills, um, some specific techniques for improving our mindfulness. Mindfulness occurs naturally in everyday life. You don't have to practice meditation in order to be mindful. I have known some very mindful people in life who never meditated. Most of us, however, are only intermittently mindful. And we can tremendously improve and increase our mindfulness by engaging in some sort of mindfulness practice. The good news is you can, you, can apply, you can start applying mindfulness in your life right away. It's free. Um, you don't have to have a teacher or a therapist. You don't have to have a prescription. And you can just try it and see if it works. So, and there's many teachers, organizations, structured programs, and apps you can download to help you um, learn and improve your mindfulness. So, first I'm going to talk about meditation. There's three primary types of meditation. The first one is called focused attention. And focused attention is where you choose a word that makes you feel peaceful or you watch your breathing. And you have in your packet a brochure that's called The Method of Centering Prayer. This, this practice of centering prayer was designed, created by a Catholic priest named Thomas Keating. And this brochure has one of the most beautiful and complete, easy to understand descriptions of focus meditation that I've ever read. It's a beautiful practice. It's one where you choose a word that signifies your intent, your consent, to allow the presence and action of God in your life. And you focus on that word. And this brochure explains the practice. It also gives you information for going further with the practice, whether it's um, reading other information, books, connecting with other groups or people who are doing this practice. But this is an example of focused um, meditation. Zen meditation, where you tend to focus on your breath, and transcendental meditation, which you've probably heard of, um, which in transcendental meditation, you focus on a mantra. Um, you, these are both types of um, focus meditation at well, as well. There are lots of opportunities, even locally, to learn those types of meditation, if that more calls to you. Um, uh, transcendental meditation is one that you have to pay for. The next kind of, my, of meditation is called open monitoring. And open monitoring is being receptive to sounds, thinking, your emotions and feelings, sensations, whatever it is that is happening in the moment. Focus, um, open monitoring meditation is also known as Vipassana, or insight meditation. Many of you have, may have heard of Spirit Rock, which is a local um, organization and place location that offers training in in Vipassana, or insight meditation. And here at First Church, 
we have two First Church members who have been offering training in Vipassana meditation for years. And that's Bill Coffin and Barbara McHugh. And they teach open monitoring Vipassana meditation here at First Church, right here in Loper Chapel, first and third Mondays evenings at 6 p.m. And you can just drop in. There's no cost. And if you could talk to them in church, they'd be more than happy to talk to you about, um, their, about their group. And the third kind of meditation is called loving kindness meditation. Loving kindness meditation is sort of like prayer. It's similar to prayer. You're planting seeds of goodwill towards yourself and towards others. There are many kinds of loving kindness meditation. And in recent years, two um, psycho, psychological researchers, Kristen Neff and Chris Germer, developed a form of loving kindness meditation called mindful self-compassion. They based this on the research that had been done on meditation. And another First Church member, Nancy De Niro, has completed the, the teacher training for mindful self-compassion, and she offers it. It's also an eight-week structured program. She offers it here at First Church. So there isn't, I don't think there's a date set, but she is going to be offering it again in this coming year. Yes? She's also going to do one hour um, of it at Camp Cass this year. Yes. Oh. All right. Thank you. If you didn't hear that, um, Nancy's, if you go to Camp Kaz, Nancy's going to do an hour of mindfulness, of, excuse me, of mindful self-compassion meditation. So you might want to check that out. And so there are also, there's other mindfulness practices that you can also find lo locally. So the mindfulness-based stress reduction, that's a program you do need, um, usually you need to pay for that. It's an eight-week structured program. Um, the teachers have all completed an extensive training program for this type of meditation, um, research-based. And you can, a good way to find that is to call your healthcare provider, like Kaiser offers classes in it, other, um, uh, places other health care providers offer it. And the closest guess for the number of peer-reviewed um, mindfulness, um, mindfulness research studies was, John? And who guessed that? And who, and who was the guess? Oh, I, I misheard. With, with all. With all of them. Uh huh. Bruce guess for four thousand seven twenty-one. Ah, which is a little bit closer. So, Bruce, we have a set of um, MBSR CDs that we're giving away today. So, Bruce wins a set of mindfulness um, meditation CDs. Enjoy. So some other practices that, you, that can increase mindfulness are yoga. And you know there's yoga studios everywhere. You can take classes in your gym, classes at the Y. What yoga is is a form of physical exercise with an emphasis on the breath and on mindfulness, being completely aware in every posture and movement of how you are feeling. Tai Chi, martial arts. They, these are movement practices with a strong mindfulness component. Ritual drumming. And on the internet, you can get some mindfulness practices. You can download some apps onto your phone. So two common apps that are very useful. One is called Insight Timer, Insight Timer, 
Um, that's free. And Insight Timer has thousands of meditations on it. Um, ranging, you, you can program it, you can search for five minutes or a half an hour, or an hour, however long you want to do it. They have um, focus meditations, they have open monitoring, which they will probably call insight or vipassana meditations. They have loving kindness meditations. That's one way. And there's another app called Headspace. Headspace is free to start and then you pay. However, it's a different approach and it just all depends on what works best for you. Headspace has a lot of um, sort of guide you through. It's um, more like animations and things on it to teach you. So um, you can check out these, can be downloaded on your smartphone and you can use them. Um, I also, I use Insight to time my meditations. Rather than having the buzz of my alarm go off at the end of the meditation, this way I can have a nice quiet gong. Let me know that I've completed my however minutes I'm gonna meditate. So there are benefits to learning um, meditation in a structured program or with a teacher. Because there is one downside to meditation that it, it's important to acknowledge and be aware of. When you begin practicing mindfulness meditation, you may become more aware of negative emotions or experiences that you've been pushing away when you get quiet and give yourself that space. So if you're having mental health issues, if looking at your emotions or feelings terrifies you, if you're having trouble regulating your emotions, if you're having any thoughts of self-harm or suicide, you, it would be, please check with a therapist first before you begin a mindfulness meditation practice. It may be wise for you to stabilize your emotions a bit before you begin um, a mindfulness meditation practice. And to help you remember, like, um, to help you remember to be mindful, because like all behavior change, it takes practice. You also have in your packet an envelope with some cards. If you haven't looked inside, there are some blue cards in here. And what these have on there are the definitions of mindfulness, as we were using today, uh, and like awareness of present moment, experience with acceptance, and also the quotes from scripture that, we were, that I was um, talking about today. Are, you have copies of those, and this is just something you can put on your fridge, stick on your mirror in your bathroom, on the corner of your computer, throw in a drawer, use as a bookmark, um, if it's helpful to you to remind yourself to be more mindful. Any questions? Oh, let me give you a let me give you this mic so we can hear you. Thank you. Could you say something about the meta in meditation? The meta? The meta. Yes. Yeah. M E T T A. Yes. Meta in meditation um, refers to loving kindness. It refers to, they use the word where we might say with love or with kindness in a Christian tradition. In, um, in many of the mindfulness practices, meditation practices, um, come from you know, a Buddhist or an Eastern tradition and the word that they use for um, kindness and loving kindness is metta. And often at the end of a meditation time when people are practicing, they will do a metta practice and they'll send the metta, the kindness out 
to everyone from their practice. Thank you. Any other questions? I was just curious about the, um, the um, CDs that, mm -hmm. that were being given out. Mm -hmm. If there was a particular one that was being recommended or The CDs that I gave away happened to be a set that, an extra set that I had. Um, and as far as, he, he, um, he wanted to know if I was recommending MBSR particularly, mindfulness-based stress reduction. There are many different kinds of practices that can increase our mindfulness, including art. <laughs> in addition, or anything in which we can totally focus. But it's, I think it's important to find the practice that fits your temperament and your needs and where you are. Um, and this, there are similar elements in all of the meditation practices. Whether it's focused or open monitoring, you'll see the same focus, like in focus meditation, whether you're focusing on a mantra, you're focusing on a candle, you're focusing on a sacred word, you're focusing on your breath, you're still focusing. And that's where the benefit comes from. So we all have different sensibilities. And so it's what calls to us, what fits my level, my comfort, what I enjoy. Can I give you this so we can? How would one go about finding out which one is the most appropriate for, for me in that case? Mm -hmm. To figure out what's most appropriate, it's trial and error. Um, there are, I didn't mention this, but um, in this packet I gave you, there are three meditations that you can try. Well, there's a couple of really brief short ones in this article by the Mayo Clinic. And then there is a, a mindfulness of sounds meditation, a mindfulness of eating meditation, and a walking meditation. One thing you might think about is whether you're a person for whom sitting down and being quiet is comfortable, some people, the last thing in the world they want to do is sitting and being quiet, especially people who are active all the time and going all the time and thinking about things. The idea of stopping and being quiet is terrifying. And if you're a person for whom that's the case, you might want to do something with a physical component. For example, try yoga and see how, um, how that feels. Because you can get um, a lot of mindfulness practice from doing yoga. Um, or maybe Tai Chi. If you've ever walked in, you know, by a park in the morning or something where there's a group of people doing Tai Chi, you'll notice that each person, as they're moved, they're completely focused on what they're doing. So that's, or walking meditation. If you just don't like to sit still, walking meditation, you, you don't have to go out anywhere. Walking meditation is you're just walking very slowly. You can just be in a room, you know? You're walking very carefully and being, being mindful of how you're placing your foot on the ground and how you're picking it up and mindful of your breath, perhaps, as you're, as you're walking along. So, so it really depends on you um, for what kind of practice. And it's just a matter of trying it. Yes? I'm wondering if this would work for a small group. To do trying out different practices? Especially the walking. That sounds like that would be interesting. Yeah. That does seem like a good topic for a small group. <laughs> people interested in trying men? How many people here, since um, uh, Betty brought this up, how many people here would be interested in a group where you just got to try 
a variety of meditation practices to see what called to you, what worked for you. It could also be as um, a learning hour where you took 10 minutes, five practices, did like five practices, 10 minutes each, just to try different kinds of practices. Yeah, that would, that would be definitely possible. We can talk more. Uh -huh. You talked about not doing multitasking. Are mm -hmm. there any other things we should avoid? For example, I find I get anxious listening to the news or watching the news. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so she was wondering if there's anything that we, your question is wondering if there's anything you should avoid in order to be more mindful? Yes. Well, one thing to think about, like, and, and, she, and you said that you got anxious watching the news. So that's, that's actually a good example of being mindful. You were listening to the news and noticing that you felt anxious as you listened. So being aware that you're feeling anxious, then you can ask yourself, you know, where that anxiety is coming from. Do I want, is it because of what I'm hearing? Is it because I'm listening to the news and I'm trying to fix dinner at the same time and I just can't concentrate on both? You know, what, and, and then with that awareness, then you can make an informed decision. Maybe I do better off reading the news than listening, or maybe I need to listen to a different newscast, or maybe I need to set aside time, or maybe I need to limit the amount of time I'm listening to the news. Where, the mic, do you still have, great, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. With respect mm -hmm. to Bill and mm -hmm. uh, Coffin's um, uh -huh. meditation group, if you're a person like me who likes to do things in, in congregation with the other people, I've found that meditation group particularly useful uh, because there were other people in the group. And I, it, I'm sure it varies from individual to individual, but. Um, but I particularly uh, benefited from that group because there were other people with whom uh, we were all meditating. Thank you, Freddie. That's a really important point. And it's also another answer to Charlotte's question about how do you know what works for you. This partly depends on how much time you have available, for example, to travel to a group or you know, get somewhere and back. And, and whether you like to do things, many people who meditate find that the group, it's where two or more are gathered, you know? Um, there I will be also. So many people find that it's easier to meditate in a group with other people, um, no matter what the meditation tradition is. Some people prefer to have that, get distracted by having other people around and just want to be by themselves and focus. Um, and then there's also, like anything else with yoga or meditation, there's do I have time to go that to get dressed, to go there, <laughs> to come back, to get to work, or do I just have 20 minutes, I can do it in my living room right when I get up before I go, you know? So different factors, yes. Any other questions? So to end, I just want to um, give a few thank yous to the Mental Health Ministry leadership team, to Robin Kempster for her leadership, to Molly, Rachel, Phil, and Kit, our pastors, for their support with mental health through this, and also to um, Bill Coffin, Barbara McHugh, and Nancy De Niro for their leadership and teaching and mindfulness. So let's end with a prayer, and then please feel free to peruse the many resources we have available. You can still check out books if you would like. Just hand them, when you're done with them, you can just give them back to um, uh, Robin or me on a Sunday service, and we'll check them back in for you.
It is sometimes said that prayer is talking to God and meditation is listening to God. Holy Spirit, help us to create the inner quiet that we need to be able to hear your voice. Thank you. Amen.